our gospel text is from Mark. Um, and um, the lection, actually it is the gospel lection for the day, and they suggest that we start on uh, verse 35, but I want to go back and start on verse 32 because I'll give you a big hint. This is one of those many texts in Mark's gospel where the disciples don't get it. And if you don't hear verses 32 through 34, they're not getting it will not be quite as evident. Praise God, we know that a lot of disciples got it because we're having this conversation, amen? amen? All right, please stand for the reading of the gospel. So they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Jesus took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, they will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who, for whom it has been prepared. When the ten, the other ten, heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is Mark's gospel, the word to us this day. Please be seated. James and John's question coming to Jesus. He's just been talking about dying, trying to pre, you know, prepare them, and they come and they say, hey, when you take over the world, when you get to be king, we'd like to be on the right side and the left side. And before they even tell him what they want, they say, we want a commitment from you that you'll do this for us. Did they simply not hear what he'd been talking about? Well, we don't know. But when you read the text, they sound a bit like children, don't they? They sound like children. Well, in this concern, we are lifelong kids. Jesus trying to prepare them for his death, talking about sacrifice, but their concerns are with this world glory. They still think he's going to be glorified in this world. They don't get that piece either. They're convinced, they assume that somebody's going to get first place around Jesus, and who do they want it to be? Yep. Now, we don't know if it had happened. James and John would have had their own dispute, probably. I want the right hand. No, you have to be on the left. The other disciples get angry. Who do they think they are, James and John? They're no better than we are. Do they get upset because they understand that James and John don't understand Jesus? No, that's not. Mark seems to say they get upset because James and John got there before we did. 
I mean, it's just one misunderstanding, one little piece of the disciples not getting it after another. And some of you may remember, that's one of the things that Mark's gospel does even more than the other three gospels. Repeatedly, the disciples just aren't getting it. But Jesus says to them, and in my imagining, he makes eye contact with them all. He says, you are not like the Gentiles. Now, he's not saying that because he's trying to put down the Gentiles. He's trying to tell them who they are in God. And I can imagine him looking into their soul. You are not people who lord it over other people. I am here to show you another way to live. Another kind of glory, it involves sacrifice and more. So, how does this relate, this text in Mark, to the annual stewardship sermon? Well, we've got two pieces in this message that answer the question, or try to, how can we put God first in our lives? And as a part of that, how is it that we don't more of the time? Well, now, please know that every time I give a sermon, I don't think I'm doing something comprehensive, right? This is not, this is, these are not the only two things that are involved in putting God first. But I think they're important, so let me share them. Number one, to put God first, you have to trust God. You have to trust God. You have to trust that God, this mystery in the world that we call God, that we understand shown more fully in Jesus than in any other way, cares for you and cares for you. By that I mean loves you and providence cares for your life, takes care of you. Is trusting God an issue for you? Well, I'm sure there's not a person in this sanctuary that has not experienced distrust of God and confusion or feeling lost at one time or another in life. Because that's one of the core pieces of spiritual formation is to grow more trusting of God. Can I have an amen? Trusting in God is a part of the core of what it is to be mature in our faith. Our trust is to grow over the months and years of faith. So that 30 years after we, we uh, are committed, let's say, to, to following Jesus, we have more trust in the presence of God in our lives and in the world than we had 30 years ago. That's what maturing in the faith partly is about. So what gets in the way of trusting God? Well, I'm going to be oversimplified here, but maybe not by much. Fear. It's fear that gets in the way. If you are going to pledge or you are going to give consistently to this church, you have to trust that if you give to God at the beginning of the month before you give to your other obligations, there will be enough for the other obligations at the end of the month. Amen? That is a kind of trust in God. You may not think about it that way, but that is part of it. Now, if we don't trust God, the fear element will will basically control our cerebral cortex and we'll find all kinds of reasons not to give. And we may not look deeply enough to realize that our, our choices are really fear-based because there are all kinds of things we can do instead of acknowledging our fear. We can blame others, lots of different possibilities. But if I can't trust God to care for me, then what I will choose to do usually is to give to various charities, including BCUMC, out of my, I love this word, but not so much at this moment, discretionary income, which for a lot of us here is less than it was six years ago. I'll give to God when I've covered my necessary expenses. Now, I've, I've heard several of you talk that way, and I, I'll, I'll admit it, I've talked that way, our necessary expenses. What does that say about God? Well, you're great, God, but necessary, you're not. Okay. Hopefully, by the end of covering my necessary expenses, I'll have something left over. If I trust God to supply my needs, 
And I'm not saying that's always easy. Uh, there's a whole lot of things involved here, I know. But if I trust God and I grow in my trust that God will supply my needs, then I will experience my giving to BCUMC and to other places. I will experience financial giving as what I call the completion of the sacred circle of generosity. Because I will be grateful. I will have a sense that I have received already. Can you feel that sense? That what, however hard I have worked to make my money, it doesn't ultimately belong to me, and it, doesn't ultima it ultimately comes from something bigger than me. It comes <coughs> somehow through the creator, through the God of the universe, that kind, so that when I give back, I have this sense that I'm returning something. Not that I have control over this little pot of money and now I'm going to dole it out here, I'm going to dole it out there, I'm going to dole it out here. If I don't trust God, I know that commitment to giving is harder. And it is likely to be accompanied by that really uh, epidemic word in American society, anxiety. I'm not calling for an amen. If we don't trust God, our lives have more anxiety. If I do trust God and I experience my giving as a response to God in that, that sacred circle of generosity, I will find it easier to have to take a risk, to take it off the top for the ministries, for the charities that I commit to. And all of this trust stuff, and I know that you all know this, those moments when you choose to trust over not to trust can be some of the most satisfying moments in your life. Amen? At that moment that you say, I've got fear, but I'm not going to choose out of fear. I'm going to choose out of trust. So that's number one. How do we put God first? Choosing to trust. Number two. Uh, what also comes up around financial giving is what can I, what, when we have the sense that what, that what I can give is so little, what I can give is so little that it's not going to make a difference. Or, and some, and some of us have vulnerability around this, or if the people who count the money think that I'm given 10% of my income, that would embarrass me. Now, not many people here know how much we give, but a, very, a few do. And if you're concerned about, then, about that, in the moment that you're concerned about that, and I absolutely get that we have vulnerabilities around this, at the moment that you're concerned about that, are you putting God first? Nope. Who are you putting first? Well, you're putting first your own illusion about what other people will think, right? So in this case, you're not even sure that they would care, <laughs> right? But these are all just p parts of the things that we deal with. So in that thinking, God really is not factored in. The Holy Spirit isn't. Um, what I have is so little it won't help. I'm embarrassed. Okay. So embarrassment. Well, let me tell you what I think about God and embarrassment. And sometimes we are embarrassed. Sometimes people say things that make us feel humiliated. I obviously get that. That happens. Everybody's experienced that at one time or another. And you know what my, my sense of what happens with God at that time through the Holy Spirit or through the presence of Jesus? Those are the times that God hugs you the most. Every time somebody says something that diminishes you, the warmth and the love of God and the heart of God is right there with you if you choose to open to it, look for it, receive it. Amen? But we have to be awake to, to look for that and not buy into the diminishment that someone might give or to our imaginings of diminishment. So a scripture comes to mind here that widows might in Luke. That short story where Jesus is in the temple with the disciples, they're watching all the contributors. And it says a lot of them are wealthy. And then this woman comes in. We don't know, she never, she never has a name. We don't know how old she is, but we know she's poor. She comes in and she puts into the offering two small copper coins. Now we are to get that two small copper coins is next to nothing. And we are to get 
that she is giving without fear, and number two, without any concern for what anyone else thinks. Amen? She is fearless. It, it's, uh, it's amazing. Now, when we, when we feel small, and that what we do, and it's not just about money, there are other things too, but we're focusing on money today. When we feel small and we think that what we choose doesn't make a difference, I invite you to remember that story of the widow and her mite. Because Jesus makes sure that the disciples get that what? That those two copper coins and her choice made a difference to God. Amen? May not have had anything to do with the temple budget. Not done much. But more importantly, that widow's choice made a difference to God. Our choices always matter to God, who I sense looks upon us with compassion and hope that we will be generous, that we will have the courage, the trust, um, um, the exercise of our free choice and will to be generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure. So what if we chose, in those moments when we are feeling empty or um, lacking in substance, lacking in material things, afraid, um, when we are experiencing some degree of poverty, when we are feeling psychologically too small to matter, how would it impact our life and our giving if we realized in that moment that we are being tempted. We are being tempted to turn away from God. We are being tempted to follow our own illusions. We are being tempted to grow in accepting those illusions smaller. What if every time that kind of experience of vulnerability happened to us, we, we had a little something to say, aloud or silently, such as, I know God loves me, praise God. All of a sudden, our attention is off the being at Jesus' right and left hand, which is part of what we're talking about here, <laughs> off of our fear, off of our, our um, desire for the success of the world, and it's back to God. We're participating again. We're entering in that sacred circle of generosity. Thank you, God. You love me. It's hard for me to sense it right now, but I claim that it is true. I choose to put my attention on you. What if I shifted my attention in those moments from pain to gratitude, from diminishment to expansiveness, to generosity, from the world's temptations to God's grace. Wow! How would that, how would my life be different if I put God first? So in closing, if you would participate up with me, I want to try something. Um, um, I want us to say together, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is first with this gesture. There are two sentences. They're very similar, but slightly different. The first sentence is, our choices matter, and God loves us all. And while we say that, I'll have you repeat after me, and please put your hands outward like this, with the, with the intention, then, of, of, of encompassing, of meaning everybody in this sanctuary. And then you'll put your hands on your heart and repeat after me, my choices matter, and God loves me. Can we try it? All right. Please repeat after me. Our choices matter, and God loves us all. Our choices matter, and God loves us all. My choices matter, and God loves me. My choices matter, and God loves me. So be it. Amen.